Thanks for watching one of our messages today. My name is Caleb Combs and I'm the gathering pastor here at the river and we would love to connect with you. An easy way to do that is text River Connect to 97000 or you can visit our website, theriverchurch.cc for more information. If you'd like to financially contribute and give to the River Church, you can text an amount to 84321 or again, visit our website and click the giving tab. We hope you enjoy the message today. It's good to be together with you this morning. Thankful just to gather together God's Word, opening it together. We know that He is here. He is with us. Isn't that like a reality this morning? Maybe a reminder to you that He is here. He is with us. And I'm so grateful for that, right? It's nothing apart from Him. But it's everything with Him. Right? We need Him to speak this morning. We need Him to move. We need Him to work. And so, uh, in just a moment, we're going to ask Him to do that. If you've got a Bible, please open it up to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. We'll be there in just a few moments. I want to welcome everybody who's joining us online as well this morning. Thank you for being a part of our gathering. This morning, we get to talk about uh, one of God's greatest designs. We're going to do that all through this month, and that is the design of the family. And it is God's design. Now listen, before we get started, I just want to make a few disclaimers here. I know that when we come into family month, I know that there are a lot of situations being represented in this room and watching online and all over the place. I, I know that. We have kids here of all ages. Um, some are a long ways from getting married. I'm looking at my daughter. Some are nearer to getting married, and um, right around the corner, we have adults who are not married, some don't want to be, some want to be and are not yet. We have some of you, of course, are married, you have kids, we have uh, grown kids who are living out of the house, we have kids who are living in the home, um, we have some of you are, are married but have never had children, some of you are married but or were married but are now divorced, some of you are remarried, there's blended family situation. There's a lot of stuff that happens when you talk about family. And uh, I realize there's a lot of dynamics to all of that. But listen, I urge you not to tune out uh, this month. I urge you, if it, if it seems like maybe it doesn't apply, um, I urge you to tune in. And the reason for that is we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about this month Talking about the family is under attack in our society like never before, right? We know this. We'll talk about it a little bit, but it's critical that we know what God says about the family and the design of it. So we're going to go back, okay? We're going to sort of hit the reset button when, you're, when your computer is freaking out and when the software is not working correctly and when stuff's not working you know, properly, right? Sometimes it is time to... Stop everything and reboot. And that is what we are going to try to do. We're going to go back and look very carefully over this, this month at the original design of God. And um, so this morning, <laughs> we're looking at what a man is supposed to be. And before you guys get up and decide you're going to use the restroom and leave, we already locked the doors. So, no, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> right? What, what did God intend a man to be? Um, what did he intend, we'll see this next week, a, a woman to be? What does he intend children to do and to be? What does he intend marriage to look like and parenting? And so we're going to look at these things this month. And as I said, it's vital that we really discuss these things right now because our culture is doing everything it can, and I do mean everything it can, to scrub God's original design from human life. And you see it, right? The relentless, feverish, frantic, maniacal attempts to erase the divine design of family from our world and to try to redefine it. Every commercial 
uh, says it, every show, every movie, every billboard, every magazine, everywhere you look, trying to normalize uh, the brokenness uh, that we're seeing in our world, and specifically in regards to the family. Everywhere they can say it, they are. And they're saying God's design is wrong. They're saying his design is old, it's archaic, it's, it's limiting. They shout, love is love, and it can be whatever we want it to be. But they're wrong, and our society is paying the price for these things, right? And for all their efforts, right, here's the truth. Our society isn't getting better. It's not going to get better when you break God's design. It doesn't work like that. I mean, you judge a thing by its fruit, right? <laughs> People aren't happier. They're not freer. Marriages aren't better by breaking God's design. People aren't more fulfilled. They're not more satisfied. Life isn't finally full of meaning because we've thrown off the shackles of what God has said. The fruit of what we are doing is rotten and it stinks. And unfortunately, as a society, we're really paying for it in so many ways. Listen, there's always unintended consequences to breaking God's commands. And unfortunately, as a pastor, I see it often. Many of those unintended consequences come to the kids. So let's go back. Let's reset, okay? And uh, we're going to see God's design for each aspect of the family. Man, woman, children, marriage, parenting. We're going to do that this month, and I pray that it will be a help and a blessing to you. Well, with that said, Ephesians chapter 5, take a look at verse 25, and then we will get started. We're going to pray, okay? It says, husbands, love your wives, and here's the careful words, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Let's pray together, okay? Lord, we love you. We are grateful to you to be together this morning, Lord. And we really come confessing our need. We come admitting our inability. We come, Lord, um, in need of you opening your hand, as, as the word says that you open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. I pray this morning, Lord, you'd help us to hear from you. Family, just ask the Lord this morning to speak to you. If you see your need, just ask him this morning, Lord, speak to me. Help me to hear from you. Open your word. Open my eyes, open my ears, open my heart to hear from you this morning. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right, so we begin with a question. What is a man? I have no idea. Just kidding. Okay. We've already said, right, we've already noted, we cannot look to our society or our culture or our world for the answer to this question. It is in the world, as Jesus said, the blind leading the blind. Does not happen. Thankfully, though, we have always had the answer to this question in the Word of God. Always had it. So let me ask it a little bit differently, okay? Biblically, what is a man? What did God intend when he created man? A few questions, right? Is man just a general term that we use to just inject whatever we want into it, right? Whatever we want it to be, it's just sort of a term, a general term, or is it something specific? Is it a fluid thing? Is it something that changes based on whatever we want or whatever we decide that we want it to be? Or is it a fixed thing? Is a man a man always? Is a woman a woman always, regardless of whatever they might say and do? Well, the answer to the first two questions is no. We cannot make man into whatever we want man to be. We can't do that. And the reason we can't do that, please hear me, the reason we don't have the ability to do this is because it's not our design. It's not our thing. We didn't create it. We didn't invent it. We didn't make it. We didn't design it. We are not free 
It's not our creation. It's not our invention. It's not our design. We are not free to take what God has made and change it. Gender is his design. It's his thing. It's not ours. We are not free to take what God has created and make it into something else. We're stealing from him to try and do that. Now, it is also not a fluid thing because God is not fluid. <laughs> Again, right? He created man. He designed man to be, he designed woman to be something specific, very specific. And he, he's never confused about the gender of an individual, even if they are. And I don't say that as joking. I say that with a burden. He is never confused, though many in our world, and specifically our children, are being targeted Many are confused today. It's tragic. Along with this is the fact that he does not change. God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. And he does not make mistakes. He does not get it wrong. Otherwise, he would not be God. There are no modifications that are necessary. There are no reassignments that are necessary. There are no updates or fixes that need to be made. Now, the answer to the last two questions, though, is yes. Are genders a fixed thing? Yes, they are. Why are we having to talk about this? Because it's under attack in our society like never before. Are genders a fixed thing? Yes. Again, God doesn't get it wrong. And the Bible is crystal clear about this, that he forms each person. Listen to this, Psalm chapter 139, beginning in verse 13. For you formed, God did, right? You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made, David said. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you, right? The bones and the ligaments and everything. He says, when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes, God, saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me when yet there was none of them. Listen, a male is a male with unique male chromosomes, characteristics, and features. A female is a female with unique female chromosomes, characteristics, and features. And these never really change, despite every attempt to do so. The traces of God's original design for that person will always be there, regardless of the attempts to cover it up, right? We know this to be true. We read it from the very beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. What do we read? It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And then it goes on in verse 27 and says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God went so far as to actually declare their gender. Not just man, not just mankind, God made mankind, but God went so far as to declare their gender and said, male and female, he created them. It's very important. Listen, at the heart of all this gender confusion, you know, uh, pronouns, gender reassignment, all of these things that are going on in our world today, at the heart of it all is an attack on God himself. It says that God is wrong, that God got it wrong, that he failed, that he makes mistakes, that, that, that somehow really, you know, we understand better. It's an attempt to put ourselves in the driver's seat. It's an attempt to put ourselves in the place of God. Stealing his design, ignoring his patents, ignoring his intent, ignoring his will, and deciding as though we have the right to do so, Deciding what we will be. And listen, it's all a game. It is. It's not reality because, again, we're not really changing anything. We're just playing around with things we shouldn't. It's what people are doing in marriages. It's what people are doing in, in these things, right? We're just playing around with things we shouldn't. We're breaking things we shouldn't break. And we're suffering very real consequences. Though we are playing, we're suffering very real consequences as a result of it. We saw there in Genesis 1 that man was created in the image of God, the Latin imago Dei, right? Image of God. And this means 
please hear me, that man's purpose, if you want to know what your purpose is, man's purpose is to reflect God. That's what we are. That's what we were designed to be. Hear it again. Our purpose as people, we were created to reflect the characteristics of God. We're like the moon. <laughs> you know, the moon doesn't have any light on its own. It doesn't. The moon is what? Simply a reflection. It glows in the night sky because it reflects the, the light of the sun. That's all we are. That is what we are called to be. We see it everywhere throughout the scriptures. We are meant to reflect God, who he is, to a world that does not yet know him. Leviticus chapter 11 verse 45 tells us to be holy. Why? Because he is holy. Reflect him is the idea. Luke 6.36 tells us to be merciful. Why? Because he is merciful. Reflect him. Ephesians 5.1 very simply tells us, therefore be imitators or reflect God as dear children. 1 Peter 2.21 tells us to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus. And of course our Lord Jesus said to us over and over those two simple words, follow me. Reflect me. Right? He wasn't just saying follow walk behind me. <laughs> he was saying, do what I do. See with your eyes. Watch. Listen with your ears, right? See what I am doing. Do what I do. The disciples were learning from Jesus. This is how we are to be. Listen, this means a true man is not just a guy who can grow a beard. If you can't grow a beard, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I love you. Okay, no. It's not just a guy that can grow a beard. It's, it's not, you know, the guy that can bench press twice his weight. It's not the guy who's got the biggest, coolest truck. Right? Like, this is not what a man is. That's not the definition of a man, right? That he has the most boots in the building. You know what I mean? That's not the definition of a man. He is a man who reflects most closely and carefully the character of the Lord Jesus. We were created, guys, in his image to reflect who he is to others. Ladies, the same is true for you. You realize, I think it's actually pretty neat that God created two very specific genders because just one is not enough to accurately reflect him. <laughs> you, as women, reflect him in ways we don't. And you're like, duh. And we're like, we know, right? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All these wonderful attributes and characteristics that you uniquely can reflect of who God is. It's beautiful to see, and you'll never see it in me. <laughs> We are unique. We are different. We cannot blend these two things, right? God has been very specific. And so if we look at the first man, of course his name Adam in Hebrew means man, we see a few things, right? As we said, number one, we see that he was created in the image of God. He was something of a mirror. That's what he was created to be. He was meant to reflect God. He was never God himself. He was never divine. He was never more than a human being. He was only a reflection of God. He was like a child imitating its father. Adam was to know God and to watch him and learn from him and then imitate those things, right? God's responses, God's attitudes, what God loved, what God hated. These were to be seen, understood, and taken, and they, they were to become Adam's as well, right? So what God loved, Adam was to love. What God hated, Adam was to hate. This is what it was to be, right? And every person who would come after Adam was to do the same, and so had sin not entered the world, we would have had this beautiful thing where every person walking around was some reflection of who God actually is. By the way, I'm describing heaven to you. Can you imagine? The Bible says that the angels stand in awe of the multifaceted, manifold wisdom of God. Right? That there's so many sides and it's, it's literally infinite, right? 
And then we as his people are going to be expressing who he is and reflecting who he is to each other. What a blessing heaven is really going to be. This is what it's meant to be. So first thing, right, he was created in the image of God. But number two, for Adam to be able to accurately reflect God means that obviously Adam was designed to be in relationship with God. He had to be in relationship with God to be able to do this. And so please hear me. Please hear me. Man was never created to be on his own. Never. Never created to be independent of God. You realize that, right? We were never created to be independent of God. Not ever. And this is why God's first and greatest commandment we find in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. What is it? You shall love, it's called the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your, with all your strength. This is what God says. This is what I want from you. I want to be in real relationship with you. I want you and I, right? This relationship, we were, we were always created to be in this relationship with God. By the way, this is why, it, you know, it explains why people don't do well apart from the Lord. We do not do well apart from God. We were designed to be in relationship with him. When we're not, we are a disaster. Everything is broken. That's why the Bible says that we are, when we are in relationship with God, we are alive. That's why the Bible says when we are not in relationship with God, we are dead. There's no simpler way of saying that. And so listen, in terms of our reset this morning, we have two, the two main purposes of man. Here it is. Number one, to be in relationship with God. And number two, to reflect him to everyone around us. Those are our purposes, to know God and to make him known. Now what this means is that a real man is selfless. I say this to my, my sons all the time. A real man is selfless. Nothing tells me that, a, that a, a man is actually a boy like selfishness. A real man is selfless. Because, why? Because the Lord Jesus is selfless. Right? Because of what he did. Philippians 2, 3 tells us nothing. He did nothing through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, he did all of these things, right, not for his own interests, but for the interests of us. Tells us to let this mind be in you, which was in him. A real man sacrifices his own needs and his own wants and his own desires for others. That's what a real man does. Why? Because Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians 5.7 a real man is loving because God is love and because our Lord Jesus Christ loved us and gave himself for us. A real man is humble. Isn't humility attractive? Isn't it a blessing? And let me flip it around. Isn't pride disgusting? Don't you hate it? I hate it. I hate it in me and I hate it in others. A real man is humble because our Lord Jesus Christ humbled himself, Philippians 2, 8, to the point of a servant who then took himself, put himself on a cross for us, right? A real man, guys, how are you doing? You okay? <laughs> a real man is obedient to God. A real man doesn't play around with sin. A real man is obedient to God. Why? Because Jesus Christ was obedient to his father, Philippians 2, 8, obedient to the point of death. A real man is faithful and dependable. Why? Because God is faithful. In fact, the Bible says even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. He can't deny who he is. A real man is joyful. Why? Because our Lord Jesus is full of joy. We often don't think about that, right? Jesus being full of joy. But the Bible actually says he was anointed with the oil of, of gladness more than anyone else. Do you, do you ever see Jesus laughing and singing and celebrating and happy? You should. A real man is peaceful because he is the prince of peace and we reflect him. 
A real man is long-suffering, isn't losing his temper and losing his mind. Why? Because our Lord Jesus bore our griefs and carried our sorrows patiently. Because the Lord, according to Numbers 14, is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression. Why is a real man long-suffering? Because our Lord is long-suffering. A real man is kind because God has shown us great kindness, Titus 3, 4. A real man is involved in good things rather than evil because our Lord Jesus is holy and righteous and just and never sins, right? Be holy, God said, as I am holy. A real man is gentle. He's not violent, he's gentle because the Lord, Isaiah 40, 11, gently leads us. Hosea 11.4, he drew us near to himself with gentle cords and bands of love. A real man is self-controlled, or rather spirit-controlled, because, right, our Lord Jesus was never out of control and was always under the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. We could go on and on, right? But, but why are these the traits of a real man because they are the traits of the man, the Lord Jesus Christ. We were designed to reflect him. We were made in his image to reflect him to the world around us. So listen, as we come to Ephesians 5.25, we see this same pattern. Look what it says there. Husbands, love your wives. Why? <laughs> Why should we do this? Well, we've been seeing it, right? Because just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So, in what is, I believe, one of the clearest passages in the Bible instructing husbands how to treat their wives, we read the very first command there is to love them. Wives, get your elbows ready. Right? The word love there means to cherish. It means to treasure. It means to find your joy and your affection in that person. Go ahead now. Just, just give it to him right there. Okay. Right? It means to cherish, to treasure. Husbands, take note. We are to cherish our wives, to treasure them. Listen, you know, the idea is, right, that you don't just say you love them, but that they know you do. Right? It's like I've, I've met some people that are like, my wife knows I love her. I told her 20 years ago when we got married. If it had changed, I would have updated her and let her know. You know, it's like, what? No, no, listen, to be cherished, to be treasured, to find your joy in someone means they're going to know that. It means you don't need Valentine's Day. Listen, I just got you off the hook, guys, right now. I just got you off it. You don't need Valentine's Day to say it. You don't need whatever sweetest day is. Who knows where that came from? <clears throat> Yeah, Hallmark, yeah. <laughs> right? But like, to find our joy, to look to them alone for our affection and to receive and to express love. That's the word there. But please notice, again, why are we to do this, right? It's because this is what Jesus did. He found his joy in you. He found his joy in me. The verse says it, right? Just as. That's how much we're supposed to love and cherish our wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So listen, a real man, a real husband, cherishes and treasures his wife. He does not use her. He does not dishonor her. He does not abuse her. A real man does not do those things to his wife because our Lord did not do those things to his bride. A real man treasures and honors and cherishes the woman that God has given to him because this is what Jesus did. He treasured us. And so listen, this verse gives us another clue as to what a real man is. We've said it. He's selfless. And he is sacrificial. Look what it says. Notice the words. Just as Christ also loved the church and then what? And gave himself for her. Can I talk to any young unmarried women here this morning? If you meet a guy that is selfish, self-centered, thinks about, and listen, ready, talks about himself, run, 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 
If you meet a guy that pushes you to sin, he's not thinking about you. He's thinking about him. Run. If you meet a guy that makes you feel like you are less, that you're nothing without him, run. If you meet a guy who has to have everything his way, doesn't serve, doesn't give to others, isn't thinking about other people, run. This is not a man. This is a child. It's a little boy. And he hasn't grown up. And sometimes they're full-grown adults and they haven't grown up. Look for a man who is like Jesus. He is selfless and sacrificial. You want a man who will love you and they will show you by giving themselves up for you. As Jesus did. In short, you want a man, you don't want a little boy. Unfortunately, those are hard to find these days. I look around at some of you young men and I'm, I'm blessed by you. Because you are young men, selfless and sacrificial and you love the Lord. And it's a blessing to see it. And I'm telling you, it's a wasteland out there because we have told people to be all about themselves. And then we wonder why we can't find anybody. Listen, we've got a shortage of men today and we will continue to have that as we move further and further from the Lord. Guys, a real man is a selfless person. He serves others. He gives to others. He is focused on meeting the needs of those around him. He puts the needs of others above himself and his needs and his preferences. He is a servant because our Lord was a servant. He sacrifices his own needs, his own preferences, his own wants for the needs of others. A, a man, a husband, a father is like this because Jesus is like this. It is always so sad for me to see grown men who believe the world revolves around them. They throw little fits when things don't go their way. When all their preferences are not met, it's so sad to see. This passage, it warns us, right? Ephesians 5, it goes on, it says that husbands, they serve their wives in an incredible and beautiful way. I'm going to show you something here in verse 20, 26 and 27 that I believe uh, is one of the greatest blessings that a husband has, has been given. Um, I want you to see this. It's absolutely incredible. The husband who gives, who loves and gives himself up to his wife and for his wife can do something. Look at verse 26. So that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Husbands, listen to this for a second, okay? If you cherish her and give yourself up for her, there is something that you will be able to do. You will be able to help heal her. I want you to hear this. It's very clear in the passage. You say, what? Help heal her? Yeah, listen, as a pastor, I see it often. Many women come into marriage with lots of hurts and regrets and pain and things that have been done to them. All kinds of stuff has happened. And here we are told that a husband that loves his wife and selflessly shows that by giving himself up for her is going to be able to join in with the Lord in the healing process in his wife's life. It's beautiful. He will be able to help in the healing of pains and stains and the hurts of the past. Notice the words really carefully. Look what it says. So that he might sanctify her. The word translated sanctify there, the Greek word um, hagiadzo. It's a word that means to, to take something and to separate it and set it apart for safety. Okay, to, to take out of danger and to reserve for safety. That's the word, hagiazzo, separate and set apart. Uh, here's an example, okay? Let me just help you understand this word for a second. The example would be the difference between my sunglasses and my wife's sunglasses. Okay, you're like, what? Yeah, okay, let me explain. My wife's sunglasses, let me start with mine. My sunglasses are in a case. They are protected. Um... They're in a specific, a specific spot. I know exactly where they are at all times. I can find my sunglasses. <laughs> and they are in great shape. They look like the day I bought them five, six years ago. There's no damage on them. They're fantastic. I know exactly where they are right now. My wife's sunglasses are in, a, are in the same drawer we keep keys and pens and nail clippers, and metal files, and bits of sandpaper, and angle grinders, and no, I'm just kidding, right? 
As you can imagine, the, the damage difference between our pairs of sunglasses, and that is if they are actually in there. We, sometimes we don't know, right? But I actually don't know how she wears them. I don't know how she sees through all the scratches. It doesn't make sense to me. And though I give her a hard time, I, I secretly admire her ability to not care about things that don't matter. I really do. It's a blessing. But listen, if you were to take my wife's sunglasses out of that drawer and then put them into a protective case to prevent them from further damage, I would say to you, you should probably do that within the day or two that we bought them because it's too late by now. But listen, you would be using this Greek word, right? Hagiazo. You're, you're, you're separating and then setting apart, protecting from future damage is the idea. And, and listen, here amazingly in this passage, we are told that a husband... Husbands, listen to this. You uniquely have the ability to do this in your wife's life. You have the ability to help separate her from her past and then to set her apart for good things. A husband can join in with the Lord in this process, pulling her out of the junk drawer, as it were, of her past and separating her from those things. From the hurts and the, the regrets and the pain, things that have been either done by her, those are regrets, or things that have been done to her, those are hurts. A husband is called by God to help separate his wife from those things so that, listen, she is no longer bound to them. She is no longer tied to them anymore, no longer held by those things anymore. Notice what it says, that he might sanctify separate, set apart, and what does it say? Cleanse her. Cleanse her. The word there means to make pure, to cleanse from all filth. It's the idea, again, of cleansing from all the past stuff. And how does it happen? Look what it says. We are told, with the washing of water by self-help books. That's not what it says. With the washing of water by the word of God. Guys, please hear me. The ability to separate your wives from the hurts and pain of the past, the stains of her past, the ability to wash her from those things is through the word of God. It really is. It's through the word of God. And you will only be able to help in this if you first cherish her and give yourself up for her. And then secondly, that you know the word of God. Listen, we must be in the Bible regularly. We don't have to be scholars, but we've got to be in the Bible, right? We've got to know what God's Word said. It's like medicine. We can only prescribe what we know about. It's why the enemy works so hard against you as a man to keep you out of the Word of God so that when those situations come up, you don't know what to do. You don't know what to say. You don't know how to help. But man, the Word of God makes it so that we are a part of this process the husband who knows the word of God can apply the word of God to the wound. That's the power, the word of God, not, not the husband. The, the power is the word of God, but the husband plays a role and is able to apply these things to those things to bring about separation and cleansing for his wife's heart. Listen, however, the self-centered man, I want you to understand, will never love his wife enough to do these things. Just won't because it's all about him. Look at what can happen here in verse 27. Look what it says. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Here we're sort of bouncing between the example of our Lord Jesus towards the church and also a husband and his wife, right? He's using the picture of Jesus and the church and then telling us as husbands towards our wives. Look what it says. The point here is that a husband is able, through the word of God, to present to himself, his wife, as glorious. It means, the word there means free from anything that would dishonor her. Free from all the stuff. Look what it says, not having spot or wrinkle. Now again, this isn't talking about physical wrinkles. We can't stop those. The word spot there means stain. It means to remove all of that. It's, it's referring to anything that could mark her in a bad way, right? Again, pain and hurt and regrets and patterns and habits. It's through the word of God we remove these stains. A husband can be the primary way that this is applied in his wife's life. What a beautiful ministry we've been given. 
And then notice wrinkle, again, refers to anything that could trip her up. That's what the word actually means. It's, it's more like a wrinkle on the floor, something that would trip you up and, and cause you to stumble. Something in the road as she's walking. A husband can help to heal his wife from the things that would cause her to stumble and fall. This is incredible. It says that she should be holy and without blemish. Again, the idea that she should be separated from those things and without anything that holds her back from following the Lord the way that she could. Is this possible? Absolutely it's possible, and it's right here. The world has no idea how to separate themselves from their past. No idea how to deal with guilt, remorse, regret, and pain. Zero. Not a clue. Endless books have been written. It's right here. This is how it happens. It's the word of God. Applied properly brings healing. It's incredible. And it's the ministry we've been given as men. Look at this. So we read verse 28. So <laughs> husbands ought to love their own wives. We're to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And also, we already love ourselves, don't we? Look what it says there, verse 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Uh-oh. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. One thing is uh, true about us as people. We love ourselves. The idea, I just don't love myself enough. Wrong. <laughs> the fact that you're thinking about yourself shows wrong. You're thinking about yourself, right? I just need to love myself more. No, no, actually what you need to do is you need to know the Lord and love the Lord. You need to love others. We love ourselves plenty. We really, really do. We take care of ourselves. We clothe ourselves in preferred garments. We selected our clothing this morning. We did not walk over to a selection of burlap bags and put on whichever one was worst, you know. We wash ourselves to make ourselves clean. We're constantly evaluating. Please don't leave me hanging up here. We're constantly evaluating our, our hunger <laughs> and our thirst. You know, I could, I could maybe eat. You know, I'm probably about 30 minutes from eating. You know what? I get done eating, I'm thinking, I'll probably eat in a couple hours, you know? What is wrong with me? Why do I think about this so often? I'm constantly evaluating. Do you want coffee? Yeah, I could go for coffee. I'm, as I'm asking these questions to myself all day long. How are you feeling? I'm feeling pretty good. How about you? Yeah, I'm feeling great. It's crazy up here. It really is, you know? Right? But like we think about, we think about ourselves all the time. We try our best to protect ourselves. We do this all the time. Listen, we nourish and cherish our own bodies all the time. This is what we do. Now imagine, husbands, if you thought about your wife as much as you think about yourself. Imagine if we thought about their spiritual nourishment as much as we think about our physical nourishment. Oh my goodness. Imagine if we protected them from harm the way we seek to protect ourselves. What would our marriages look like? Ready? Here's a simple rule, guys. Simple rule. Ready? Take care of your wife as much or more than you take care of yourself. And again... The reason this is the way is because this is what he did. He did not do what was best for himself. He did not spare himself. He gave himself up for us. He did not try to create his own preferences all around him everywhere he went, right? And so listen, guys, when we're tired, we carry the loads of others. And when we're in need, we give. And when we're weary, we serve. And we go on and on, right? We shoulder, we bear one another's burdens because he's done this for us, and we reflect him. This is what we're supposed to do. It's because of who he is. Look at verse 30. It says it. For this, this is why, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You know, I, when I think of the opposite of a, of a real man, I'm often, the picture of uh, Mr. Banks in Mary Poppins comes to mind, you know? If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend the movie. It's fantastic. I love it. But Mr. Banks, you know, comes home and actually sings an entire song about what everyone should do for him. And I think, what is wrong with you, man? Right? He's like, I'm home exactly at this time. And the second I step through the door, you know, my slippers are waiting for me. My children are dashing about to make things happen. My wife has 
food ready. She's dressed properly. And I mean, he's just he, like this whole song about how everybody's catering to him while he's sitting down, taking it easy after his long day. And I think, have you ever seen the day of a, of a mom, man, you know, your long day? That's not a man. Come home, shoulder the burden, carry the load, do the work because of who he is, right? We are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Let me just say in closing that a real man is a man that is dependent on God. Please hear this. A real man is dependent on God. And that is because our Lord Jesus Christ was completely dependent upon his Father. We're told in Proverbs 3, 5, right? Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him or look to him to receive. And he will direct your paths. As men, we must be completely dependent upon God. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 tells us, it shows us this. It says, and he said to me, Apostle Paul speaking, my grace is sufficient for you. Look what he says. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Guys, you feel like you don't have it? That's okay. Be more dependent on God. Know him. Grow in your dependent excuse me, your dependency. He says, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, most gladly, Paul says, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You want to know how to lead? Look to him. Follow him. In need is how you lead. That's how you do it. How do you have the right things to say? How do you know the right things to do? Stay close to him. In need is how you lead. We do not have to be the strongest person, the smartest person, or the most capable. Guys, know him and then reflect him. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness towards us. Lord, you came and showed us really what a man is. We thank you for your design. It is perfect. Lord, I pray you would help us, Lord, to reflect you accurately to the world that is around us. Lord, help us today to, to, to both know you, but also to make you known. Maybe you sit here this morning, or maybe you're watching online, or maybe you're listening to this later, and you don't yet know the Lord. Maybe you've wondered what your purpose is in life. It is those two things. It is to know him and to make him known. And life does not make sense until we come into a relationship with him. We were never built to be on our own. This morning, if you have seen your need, understand he is willing to receive you, to forgive you. But the Bible says you must confess your sin. It means that you must admit that you are a sinner to God. You must admit that. You must humble yourself. Admit that you are a sinner to him. Admit that you are separated because of your sin. Admit that you deserve judgment. But then we also ask him for his forgiveness and for his mercy. The Bible promises that he will give it. We must recognize him as Lord and as Savior. That he died on that cross for our sin. For your sin and for mine. Will you come to him this morning? Will you confess your sin and will you ask him to be the Lord and Savior of your life? He will listen. He will hear you. He will never refuse those who come to God through him. There is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. It is through Jesus Christ that we have life. So talk to him. He's already listening to you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We give you this morning and we pray that we would honor you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Hey, listen, if we can pray for you for any reason, um, I would love to pray with you. Some of our deacons will be back there in the back on the way out, also willing to pray with you. Um, we want to try to help you. We want to try to encourage you. I pray that this month will be an encouragement to you. If you do not have a Bible, I'm going to encourage you to stop by our guest services table and pick up a Bible. Just let them know you need one. That's a gift from the Lord to you. You don't have to fill anything out. Just go pick one up. 
And um, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I would love to know it. Please let me know, or if you're watching online, please send me an email. Love to be able to spend some time with you, okay? Church, can we stand?